say good morning, everybody. Come on, let's all stand if you would. And uh, I think everybody's aware of the protocols, but hey, it's time to have church. Let's put aside some of the fear and anxiety. Pastor Malik, he's on vacation, but uh, the work is ready. So come on, let's put our hands together and work. Come on now. Surrounding you, let me break at your name still. Call the sea to still, the rage in me to still every wave at your name, Jesus. 
Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, breathe, call these bones to live. Call these lungs to sing once again. I will praise Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. so hard to see it took me so long to believe it that you choose someone like me to carry your victory perfection could never earn it you give what 
what we don't deserve and you take the broken things and raise them to glory you are my champion giants fall when you stand undefeated every battle you striving cease. This is my victory. You are my champion. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you've won. He's fighting our battles for us. He's fighting our battles for us. The victory is yours, Jesus. Let's sing when I left my voice. When I lift my voice and shout, every wall comes crashing down. I have the authority. Jesus has given me when I open up my mouth miracles start breaking out I have the authority Jesus has given me when I lift my voice and shout Every wall comes crashing down. I have the authority. Jesus has given me. Jesus has given me, you are my champion, giants fall when you stand undefeated, every battle you've won, I am who you say I am, you crown me with confidence, I am seated, in the heavenly place undefeated by the power of your name i am seated in the heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered it all how many agree with that song this morning amen come on it's time for where we take that energy of worship now we move it into what we call passionate core prayer. That's where we pray with the volume that we just sang. So come on, let's praise him for his miraculous power. Come on, 35, 40 seconds. Come on, everybody, lift your voice. Let's give him praise right now.
Come on now, let's ask him to release that miraculous power in our lives today. Come on, whatever you need from Jesus, come on, let's ask him for it now. and shout every wall comes crashing down I have the authority Jesus has given me good to see some new faces that have come back. We're glad that you reached that comfort level. It's good to be back and see each and one of you. Usually we uh, have a way that we greet. Obviously we've had to change all that. So we ask that you kind of stay where you're at. But instead of uh, doing hi, how you doing in 15 seconds, we're going to turn around. We're going to get eye contact with somebody. And then you're going to tell them something good that happened this past week. That means your conversation has to be very loud. So when was the last time you had permission to be loud in church? You just got it. So after you tell them, then give them a chance to tell you something. So that means for the next two minutes, it should be loud in here. So come on, turn around, make eye contact with somebody, introduce, and tell them something good that's happened to you. You are welcome to be seated, and I hope that you met someone or got new information about somebody and was able to share as well how great of a week you had. Well, I'm here to welcome first-time attenders and guests, and if you are here visiting with us, there's a card of information in front of you that you can fill out and give to the usher as you leave today. And then also you can meet me at the Welcome Center, I'd love to get to know you and greet you, and I'd like to give you a gift and tell you more about the bridge. Can we welcome our first-time attenders and guests today? If you are new or if you've been coming to the bridge for quite some time and you would like to learn more 
about the bridge, what we believe, and maybe even more about membership, you can join me at Growth Track. It's a four-week connection group that you can do every Sunday, or you can choose a Sunday that works best for you. But anyway, Growth Track is by Zoom on Sunday afternoons at 3.30. And if you would like to join me, just email me at Pastor Lisa at bridgeforlife.com, and I will send you the Zoom link, and you can learn more about the bridge. Right now, I'd like to transition into the offering. And what we normally do, we always read a scripture before we take the offering, but because of guidelines with the COVID, we now, you can give as you leave at the usher at the door, you can give online, or you can mail your offering in. So let's read the scripture today. It's in Psalms 119, verse 36. Read this with me. Turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for giving us the opportunity to give back to you. God, you give us so much. And Lord, we are able to give in the offering, not just to further your kingdom, but to help those in need. So I just pray that you bless every gift and giver. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. amen. At this time, please turn your attention to the screen for the announcements. We want to thank you for being with us here this weekend at The Bridge. Whether you're joining in person or online, we are so glad you're here. Here are this week's announcements. Last Friday evening, The Bridge hosted the Fauquier County Fire and Rescue Award Ceremony. The 2019 Citizen Service Award was presented to our very own canteen unit for its major contribution in improving the work conditions and safety of the firefighters throughout the county. A big congratulations to all the canteen team members and the wonderful ministry they provide throughout Fauquier County. Bridge Kids Creative Arts is off to a great start this fall. The kids have been learning sign language, watercolor painting, puppets, and so much more. Creative Arts meets every Monday evening from 6 to 7 p.m. in the White Box. All elementary kids are welcome to join. The month of October is recognized as Pastoral Appreciation Month, and the elders want to provide you an opportunity here at the bridge to show your appreciation to our pastoral team. For the whole month of October, there'll be a basket at the Welcome Center for you to drop off cards, notes, and gift cards. Thank you so much for helping us celebrate Pastor Appreciation Month here at the Bridge. Young adults will be meeting again this Sunday to continue in our small group format. For directions or to simply learn more, you can email Elijah at bridgeforlife.com. We hope to see you there. Due to the inclement weather last week, the Men of the Bridge Fall Cookout has been rescheduled to tonight at 4 p.m. at the Gardener's Home here in Warrenton. The bridge will provide the meat. Just bring your friends and a side to share for a great time of community. Directions to the Gardener's Home will be at the Welcome Center table in the lobby. Hope to see you there tonight. We want to thank you so much for watching today. Please remember to keep up with us throughout the week on our social media. In case you missed any of these announcements, you can watch them again on our website, bridgeforlife.com. We hope you have a great week ahead and look forward to seeing you again next weekend. And it is really great to see you here today. And uh, man, we want to uh, welcome also those who are joining online. Man, between those on online and those who are here, I guess we have a full house today, man. Well, as full as COVID will allow us to have. I don't want to send any mixed signals online to folks here, but uh, we're so glad to see everybody here in this service today. And we're continuing on in a series that we began in the book of Philippians called Unchained to Live in Joy and Freedom. Paul finds himself in a constrained environment and uh, he's learning to cultivate his joy and the limited freedom that he has. Uh, he's finding that his faith informs him in that context. And I would say that's the same for us, right? That just because we have some constraints and restrictions on how we normally would be living our life, I think our faith still can inform us in this context. Amen? About 10 of you. All right. 
then I'm going to help the rest of you get there. All right, so let's everybody stand, if you would, for the reading of the Word. We're just going to read four verses today. Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through 30. Come on, let's read together. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. The Holy Spirit, I pray that the word of God will touch every person's life. You are aware of our personal momentums. You know of the, of the barriers and restraints that we encounter. And I know the, the word of God has answers for us. So open our hearts, open our minds, and speak. Lord, as the word is preached, I know the Holy Spirit can speak into a person's heart what they need in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 The Lord bless you to be seated today. So as we're, we're looking at this particular segment of Scripture, I'm just going to say, as I normally do, we'll be looking at some of these individual phrases that Paul used in this teaching to address what I consider to be critical, and it's this. It's called spiritual commitment. Maintaining spiritual commitment is an essential component as a follower of Christ. And some of you, you know, here we are seven months in on this thing, on this, on this COVID thing. And you probably have recognized that you've had to lean more on your personal disciplines to cultivate your faith. You found that if you don't put some effort into it, your faith begins to flounder, your faith begins to grow away. So it takes some intentionality and some work. We have to know how to monitor our commitment, how to cultivate it, because life has an ebb and flow. I was talking to somebody in between the services today, and I just said, it may surprise you as a pastor, I don't live on a mountaintop. I mean, there are some days, man, it's just, I feel like my whole day is just going against the current. And so, now there's other days when everything's great, and those are the easy days, right? You know, you just feel like the momentum and culture and everything is going the right way, and you just kind of step in and enjoy the ride. And then there's other days you're like, this is totally going upstream, and I think I'm against the rapids. And so it's a battle, it's a struggle, so a challenge followers of Christ's faith is to behave in a way that is consistent now with the power of the gospel. That, that spiritual commitment, if we don't know how to maintain it and keep cultivating it, we create this, what I call, spiritual dissonance. That we have to know how to consistently behave with our proclamations and things that we believe. Otherwise, there begins to be this disconnect. And so I have a phrase that I'm inserting today. It's not a phrase necessarily found in the Bible, but I think it's the definition of it is. And it's this. We need to ask ourselves from time to time about whether we have what I call spiritual integrity. What do I mean about spiritual integrity? It's what I say versus what I'm doing. And what I say and what I do is easy. That, that gap is closed and it's, they're similar when life is cooperating with what I believe. Where the dissonance comes in is when life is not cooperating and I begin maybe to be pulled away by culture and some of the things that are, that are pulling me away and I create a gap between what I'm saying and what I'm doing. And not only can that produce confusion in other people, it can create tension inside your own life because you go, I don't want to do this. I, why, why do, you start beating on yourself. Why did I cave in? Why did I do that? I don't want to do I didn't want to say that. I, didn't, I meant to do better. I didn't do as good as I intended. There's this tension that, cre that, is, that comes in, and it begins to create all kinds of dissonance inside of us. And part of that, let me just say this, that's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You know, that dissonance can come from the Holy Spirit poking you going, you know, you're not practicing what you're saying. 
And you go, yeah, I know, I know, I know. By the way, Paul describes a little of this in the book of Romans when he says, I don't do the things that I want to do. How many know that passage? He's describing that when there's a disconnect between what he says and what he's doing. And here's the thing. Thank God we feel the dissonance. Because that's a way of roping us back in. So as we look at this further, I want to just dive into a part of the scripture because Paul says, he uses this word called conduct. It's actually right in the beginning of the scripture that we read today. And this word that he used, it's very hard to translate because he's actually using a political and an alliance phraseology. And it, it means this, it, when, when he says conduct, he's, it comes from the root word polis, which in earlier times usually referred to the city-states to which inhabitants gave their primary allegiance. So, you know, they would take an allegiance to Rome or they would take an allegiance to their particular city. We understand that. We take an allegiance. We say, you know, the Mary, you know, I pledge allegiance to the flag. How I many understand that? Okay, so this is not out of the ordinary. It's where you commit yourself and you pledge. And then, he, so he's borrowing this to make a, make a point to the followers in, in Philippi. And he says, and it carries the basic idea of being a good citizen whose conduct brings honor to the political body to whom one belongs. So this is not trying to, let's say in Philippi, bring the honor of Philippi to them. This term was saying, you bring honor to Philippi. Honor is something that its citizens, by how they live, produces for a city-state. It's not something that the government can, can bestow on you, because honor comes from its citizens. Y'all, with, by the way, there's a good uh, civics lesson going on right here if, you have, if you've missed it, okay? Honor, listen, honor comes from us. And when we're honorable, our nation is honorable. The nation can't bestow honor. Does that make sense? Because it's made up of citizens. So if a nation is not acting honorably, there is no honor to bestow. Because its citizens aren't acting honorably. So that's under, we need to understand, this is one of those principles that has transcended 2,000 years. Okay? Now, let me go a little more further on this. The Roman society was highly community conscious. Let me, what do I mean by that? The individual was subordinate to the state. Now listen to me. Not out of coercion, but out of a willing sense of interdependence. Everybody say interdependence. I didn't say independence, and I didn't say dependence, and, and in which citizens took great pride. So what is, independence means leave me alone, I'm doing my own thing. Dependence says I ain't doing nothing because you're going to do it for me. Okay? Interdependence says we're better if we coordinate our activities together because we can get a lot more done. And this principle is, uh, is still taught in our military today. Okay, number one, they take an allegiance, an oath, right, to whatever branch of service that they're going into, correct? And then they're also taught this, that they are subordinate, not because they are forced to, but they want to serve. That's, our military is still a voluntary force. They choose to do this. Okay, now, you say, well, that's, that sounds weird. No, the Bible actually teaches this. Greater love has no man than he lay down his life for his friend. We have that principle that there is a, there's a momentum out there that is greater than us as an individual. And when you recognize that, you're more fulfilled and more gets done. It's taught in the military as well that there's a breakdown. And they give you usually, you know, the, I'm going to maybe use a phrase that might be outdated, but you'll get it. It's called a battle buddy. You don't go anywhere without your buddy. No matter where you go, you go with them. Why? Because you're way more effective Coordinate, coordinating your, your skills and your abilities with another individual, you're, you're way more effective. Your survival is way, bo way more effective. You're doing what you need to do is substantially more effective by becoming interdependent, coordinating with another individual. Everybody got me? And it's even taught sometimes an individual in the military will sacrifice themselves, take a hit for the sake of the whole unit. We oftentimes give those people medals, and we honor them. 
because they gave the ultimate sacrifice. They did something so that the unit would not suffer. So we need to understand this principle is still inside of even our own culture today. That, and we oftentimes, you've heard me say this, it's not all about you. There are still people who are still shocked by that because they think it still is about them. Their mama told them that anyway. So <laughs> it's a delayed laughter. You'll get there anyway. So this conduct is talking about a conduct that is community accountable. It's not, don't judge me, you don't have anything to say about my, that's independence. Hear me? That's independence. Interdependence says, I understand how my actions influence you, you understand how your actions influence me, and we're willing to work together to make this work. And we're going to go a little further into this. So, this idea of spiritual integrity then is a part of this communal commitment and accountability because our greatest testimony before others is our spiritual integrity. Even people who don't know Jesus know what we say and what we do and they know whether there's a gap or not. They don't even have to be orientated to our faith to go, you'll hear stuff like, you're the real deal, meaning that what you say and what you do line up. Or you can hear some things that sometimes people may not say to your face, but they say to others and go, it's just something that they attribute to, but they really don't live it. It's just something that they say, but in the bottom line is, he talks like the rest of us, she talks like the rest of us, they act. It's just something that they talk about from time to time, you just kind of put up with. Don't worry, they'll be acting like the rest of us in a few more hours. Now they won't say that to your face. But they oftentimes will relay that. What's this thing about Christianity and church? Ah, it comes up every once in a while. But in the end, don't worry. They'll be caving and they'll lose their conversation and they'll be like the rest of us here in a little bit. They're, they're admitting, they're saying to us, there's a disconnect between what you say and what you do. They're saying you don't have any spiritual integrity. So, Paul talks about this because in order to close that spiritual integrity, it often takes transformation he wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. Now get that. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Do you notice the exclamation point? Please say yes. All right. See the exclamation point? So Paul's not just kind of writing this. He's like amped up. He is stoked. He's if he was saying this, he would almost be yelling it with an excitement. Why would he write that with such enthusiasm? Because that's Paul's story. This guy used to be, listen, he embodied spiritual dissonance. He said he loved God, he served God, and then he, he got a piece of paper that said if you didn't serve God the way that he wanted to, he could have you killed. So Paul would show up in town, God loves you, and now I'm going to kill you. How many know that's real dissonance there? He, he said as he would drag them out of their houses because, quote, they didn't serve God the way that he did. And so he had a piece of paper. that. Get, so he's basically a, a, ter, a religious terrorist. How does a guy like that change? I can tell you one thing, the old had better go, and the new had better show up. And Paul was saying, here's how I close my spiritual dissonance. I got rid of the old. And I took on the new. I closed it. I said I loved God. But how I was doing it was all wrong. All wrong. And you got to remember, that was his life. That was a lifetime of training for him. This was not a window of three or four years that he had to throw out. Paul had to put out all his previous training. His entire life was wrong. To wake up one day and realize that you're not just sort of off, but to wake up one day and realize everything in my life has been wrong. Man, that'll drive you into a hole of depression. Or you'll become more militant because you don't want other people to know. Or that'll create such a hole and a gap in your life that you only can say, oh God, help me. Help me to make the change. Help me to make the correction. I thought I was right. I didn't know I was wrong. But now, today I know I am. And 
I don't, I don't know how to undo that. You're going to have to help. So Paul was that last category that I talked about. The old was gone and the new showed up. So what I'm going to answer today is this. What are the characteristics of living a worthy life as Christ's followers? I could have a pretty lengthy list, so let me narrow it down. What are some of the characteristics of living a worthy life as a follower of Christ in these difficult times? And notice I said these difficult times. Because we, we find that depending upon what's happening around us, we have to pull on certain strengths in our life. Some of these things may not have been needed a year ago, but today they're more valuable than they used to be. So what are the things that I need to be tapping into during this difficult time? So let's go to number one. Everybody read it out loud. Living a life. So living a life that's worthy by standing firm. I'm going to tell you, every point is a phrase in the scripture that we read. I'm going to give you four of these today. Every point comes right out of the text. It is the verbiage that the Apostle Paul used. So I can't say there's a lot of creativity going on here. I'm just borrowing right there. So Paul says this, I will know that you stand firm. Now again, the word that he uses is a military term. So again, he's teaching the principles of Christianity, and then he uses some analogies from the military word to help us to understand the commitment that we're talking about. He's, the, the standing firm means holding one's ground regardless of danger or opposition. It's used of a soldier who defended his position at all cost, even to the point of sacrificing his life. Another way to say it was, it was a standing firm was, this is the hill that if I'm called upon, this is the hill I will die on. We all hear the phrase, that's not a hill I'm willing to die on. Well, this was go, okay, now we're on the hill. This is that hill. And Paul says, hold steady. No retreat. No backup. This is where we stand firm. Now, i got to share this because Paul used that same word with all the New Testament churches. Because it's under the Roman Empire, and Rome has a whole value system that is in complete contradiction to what the Christians are teaching. Not just some principles, every single principle. And I'm going to show you this. So this is to the church at Philippi, right? Well, if we jump over to uh, the, the, uh, the church at uh, Corinth, which, by the way, was the most wicked city in the Roman Empire. I shared this a series on Corinth a while back. It was so depraved morality-wise that when you were considered the worst of the worst in your morals, in your expressions, they would say, you have been Corinthianized. That was not a compliment. Even pagans would use that as a negative on another. But Hey, I may be a pagan, but you're like the worst. You're, you've been Corinthianized. That means you have just hit bottom. And Paul writes to them. So there's a church in Corinth. He says, be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. What does it say there? Do what? Do everything in love. So this is not a militaristic uh, expression. It's a commitment. But he says, this commitment where you hold strong, you do it in love. He even then said this over in th the church in Thessalonica. And we just finished 2 Thessalonians. Uh, a while back, and it says, So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm, hold fast to the teachings we pass on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. So why was Paul continually telling the New Testament churches, stand firm? It's because of the value system that Rome had. And the Christians were so opposed and living such a different life. What do you mean by that? Well, here's an example. One of the things that Rome didn't mind, they said, that's okay if you have your God, but you have to be accepting of other gods. Just don't say that your God is the only God. In fact, Caesar said, I am also a God, and so if I come down the street and you're there, I expect you to kneel and I expect to hear you say Caesar is Lord. Well, you can imagine a Christian going out into the marketplace 
and uh, turning the corner, and all of a sudden, here comes the emperor with his entourage, the Caesar, and he's walking down the street. You have nowhere to go. You, in a few seconds, have to make up your mind. Am I kneeling and saying Caesar is Lord? Because if I do not do that, that praetorian guard is going to alter the trajectory of my life today. I will disappear. I don't have time to call the pastor for prayer. I don't have time to process that with my connection group leader. I got 10 seconds. What am I going to say? And Rome said, you're going to declare that Caesar's Lord or else. And the Christians had to make that tough call. Many of them found themselves in prison and put to death for that mere act of defiance. Not kneeling and not saying Caesar is Lord. They lost their lives. You say, well, what does that have to do with us today? Hey, everybody's driven around. Have you ever seen the coexist bumper sticker? Hey, just stop saying that your Jesus is the only way. There are a lot of ways. Hey, I believe in freedom of religion. I believe that people have a right to choose the God that they want to serve. But I'm going to tell you, the, the God that I serve said, Jesus, no one goes to the Father but through Jesus. He didn't say he was one of the ways. He didn't say he was one of the options. Jesus said, no one, no one goes to the Father but through me. That is so intolerant. That is so inconsiderate. Other people's faith. And I go, well, I did, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not running down their faith. I'm just saying I've already made my choice on what I believe. And for me to say, okay, then there's other options, well, then I've just called my God a liar. Well, then why would I serve a God who's a liar? So I... If I'm not convinced he's the son of God, then I should not say that I'm his follower. But if I am convinced I'm a follower, and I say, I'm sorry, but as I read it, he is the only way. He's the only truth. And we live in a culture like, so intolerant. You guys are so ill-informed. Well, I'm, I'm willing to have a dialogue, but I won't have a mockery session. But I'll dialogue. I can explain why I believe that. I can explain why I adhere to that principle. I can tell you why I think Jesus is the only way. See, we find ourselves in the same conflict that the Christians did. It's the same thing. In Rome's day, if your firstborn wasn't a son, it said it's okay to take the child's life. And so many of the Roman citizens would take their Firstborn who was a daughter and set it in an alley or take it into the wilderness and let the elements and the animals settle it. And the Christian said, that's not right. I don't care if it is legal in Rome. That's wrong. And so the Christians would go out at night and walk the alleys and walk the woods and they would listen for the cries of little babies dying in the wilderness or in the alleyways. And they would take those babies home and they would raise them as their own. Rome said... You have a right to choose. The Christian said, no, you don't. Life is life. And we're willing to even put our own personal lives and our resources behind it. We're even willing to raise another family's child who gave them up. We will do that. Christians found themselves extremely marginalized in that kind of context. The Christians found themselves marginalized in marriage, because, by the way, in Rome, any marriage was okay. I mean all of it, including pedophilia. All of it was okay. Even the Caesars practiced their immorality publicly. And then here came the Christians, one man, one woman. Rome said, how ill-informed you are, how shameful, how discriminatory you are. And the Christians said, all we know is our teachings say one man, one woman. And the Christians underwent persecution for that. By the way, you see that Rome is no longer in existence. (laughs) And the church that preached their message is still surviving today. Still surviving. If you study history, Rome was never conquered. Rome fell apart on the inside. Because their value systems were not sustainable. Their value systems could not contribute to a healthy citizenry and a healthy environment. And so Rome collapsed under its own morality. 
Nobody conquered Rome. Rome's greatest enemy was never outside of its borders. Rome's greatest enemy was in their own hearts. And they collapsed under their own value system. Why? Because it just didn't work. So you say, translate that today. There's this, let's be inventive on relationships. Okay, I see that, but I'm just here to tell you it won't work. It'll collapse. It has its own faults inside of it. I'll give you a little history that you may not even be aware of. Did you know that the government didn't even miss, uh, issue marriage licenses in the United States until 1920? Did you know that before 1920 there were no marriage licenses? That if you wanted to get married in the United States, you had to go to the church. And the church had the record of your marriage. And all it was was standing before God and before people and saying the right things. And then the church had a record book and your marriage was put in the record book of the church. And if you wanted to dissolve your marriage, guess what? You had to go all the way back to the church and all the way back to the preacher. Why did the government start issuing marriage licenses beginning in the 20s? Because they founded a thing called the federal income tax. Now, I know there's going to be those of you jumping online, going Googling right now. Shame on you. <laughs> Do your homework on your own time. <laughs> because there was a different tax rate for those who were married, they needed to auth authenticate that you weren't cheating. So that meant that the government needed to be aware that you had a, quote, legal marriage so that when you took the tax write off, you weren't cheating. So all through the 20s, the states were implementing their marriage licenses. I think one of the last ones happened around 1930 to 1931. That was the last, and I forget the last state. I want to say Arkansas, but I can't be sure of that. I might just be mocking Arkansas. So anyway, but anyway, the point being was, the marriage license is relatively new in our culture. Let me just say this. And now you see what happens when the government interferes in the value systems. That's why it never had a chance. Because it was the Christians who introduced the marriage concept into culture. It was the Christians who, who said, this is what marriage looks like, and these are the principles, and these are the frameworks and the guidelines. And, and it worked so well that even people who weren't Christians wanted to practice marriage that way. And now the government has usurped the church's authority, all started with a federal income tax, and now they're just writing what marriage is left and right. They're just making all kinds of things up and they're with no understanding of the history and where it came from and why did the by the way all religions have a variety of what their idea of marriage is it just so ironic the Christian one is the one that helps societies be healthy isn't it amazing our value system even works for people who don't adhere to it but it still works for them it stabilizes home. It stabilizes kids. It, I didn't say it was perfect. It's got its, but it's, it's got its issues, but I'm just here to tell you. It beats anything the world's coming up with. And the Christians found themselves marginalized because, quote, they weren't woke. <laughs> well, from what I've seen from the woke, you should have stayed asleep. Because it's ruining and wrecking lives. It's destroying. And again, I'm, I'm not, listen. When you experiment, you have to realize that experimenting has a personal toll on you. By the time you're done experimenting and you realize that maybe this doesn't work, how much damage have you done to your life and somebody else's life? That's why, listen. That's why God gave us his word. Because he recognized that if we all had to go on a self-discovery and experiment to learn on that, by the time we figured it out, we wouldn't have a life left. So God loved us enough to say, let me save you the heartache. Let me save you the trouble. Okay, here we go. Number two, read it out loud. Living a life... 
Now, sound, he says, in the one spirit, it sounds like Paul could just be throwing a religious cliche in. You know, like he's talking, he's writing, he's just throwing some cliche in. So it's important for us to realize he wasn't doing that. He was actually, he saw an opportunity to teach additional things because he says one spirit. Why would he say one spirit? It's kind of a weird context, a weird way to say it. Why did he throw that in? Well, because the Holy Spirit was a new concept back then in its manifestations, its implementations, and the teachings. That's why Paul spends a lot of his writings on the Holy Spirit, because the Christians were learning new expressions associated with this. And he was making sure that they weren't trying to, quote, investigate the spirits. He was letting them know that there is only one spirit here. And how does that apply to us? What's critical for us today is this. The Holy Spirit is probably the most divisive topic among Christians. Isn't it ironic when you say God the Father, it's like no matter what church you go to in the Christian realm, when you say God the Father, it's like we're all there. We got that, right? And you say Jesus the Son of God, amen, I'm all there. Holy Spirit, well, what do you mean by that? Like, uh, we're... we're Hey, I, I even had somebody say this to me one time, so I'm not mocking. This was actually said to me a couple years ago. Somebody said, the Holy Spirit, you're not one of those, are you? Where are you on the flake spectrum? <laughs> Isn't that an interesting take? They just automatically assume there was something, you know, some liberalities that were being taken there, and they said, they flake spectrum. I said, you know, I've never had that said to me before, but I said, I actually understand why you said that. I may not know your personal story, but I can only imagine where it comes from. So, no matter, can I, can we, let's just say this. I don't care what teachings you've had historically. I don't care what church you grew up in. I don't care what the doctrine of that particular church was and where you find yourself on the spectrum or whether you're on the flake spectrum or not, okay? Whatever the case may be, how about we just make an agreement here for the next few minutes? We're just going to see the scriptures that speak to the Holy Spirit. And let's look at the context of the verse. Does it sound like it's relevant for everyday life? Okay, does that make sense? Can we get, a, can we get an honest, objective jury today? You're not going to be preconceived one way or the other. We're just going to say, if I was a blank slate and I was reading these verses, what would it be telling? Would this be telling me that the Holy Spirit is for today? Here we go. Galatians 5.16. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Does he say, used to walk by the Spirit? It says, walk by the Spirit. So this tells us, that there's an ability to cooperate with the Spirit, right? If I'm going to walk with the Spirit, right? So it sounds like this is still going on, right? Galatians 5, 17. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. So this says, my flesh has a collision with the Holy Spirit. You see that? How many have ever been tempted to do wrong, and then there was another part of you going, you don't want to do that? I'm just seeing who's going to be honest, and the rest, we're going to pray for you. <laughs> okay? That is acknowledging that there is a battle between the Holy Spirit in you and your flesh. There's a conflict. So it tells us that we can walk by the Spirit. It tells me there is a conflict that happens by the Spirit. Y'all with me? Okay. Galatians 5, 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. This is different than walking. Led means, walking means to walk. Led means take a right. If it's leading me, it's not just beside me, it's ahead of me. I'm being led. Y'all with me? Okay. Then Galatians 5, 22, 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I've often said to people this. Have you ever had those qualities flow through your life? Yeah. Well, then regardless of what you think about the Holy Spirit, it sounds like he's already at work. 
How ironic that you're willing to receive his work, but not acknowledge his work. All right? So we know that he has a way of showing up in the qualities of our life. Then in verse 25 of Galatians 5, he says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Now that's really, boy, talk about a mouthful. So I can walk, okay? I can battle in the Spirit, and now I can be led. Now I can live in the Spirit, and now I have to stay in step. So it means this, there is a pace to the Holy Spirit. I can fall behind, or I can get ahead. I need to stay in step with the Spirit. Go with me? Hey, so far all I've done is just read the, the, the Bible and just clarify what, so that you see it. This is language not from Pastor Greg. This is right out of the scriptures. Y'all with me? Then in Galatians 6, 8, whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. We would thought if, if you were resistant to the Holy Spirit, you would have liked that to have said, whoever sows to please Jesus. But he doesn't say Jesus, does he? He says what? Spirit. So this tells me this. I have an ability to cultivate the activity of the Holy Spirit in my life. And that if I please the Spirit and cultivate that relationship, that it also tells me, it can lead to eternal reward and eternal life. Now, I've just touched Galatians. I stayed out of all the, the fray of other texts just to try to go basic, very simple. It just says this. The Holy Spirit's designed for every day. I can be led by it. I can be guided by it. I can have the fruit of the Spirit flow through my life. I can keep in step with it. I can cultivate a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Hey, that's just, it's, like I said, this is all in Galatians that we read. So you say, well, okay, so where do I go from here? I know there's sometimes a paranoia because of the flake spectrum. People go, oh, I've seen this, I've seen that. I'm not selling that, and I'm not telling you about all this extremities and things that have happened. Here's the thing. I'll give you a very simple prayer. God, anything that's of you in this, I want it. And anything that is not of you, just keep it away from me. But if, if that is of you, I want it. Throw out your preconceived teachings and biases and even bad experiences. You know what? Okay, I grew up in Pentecost and I saw excesses, okay? But something told me there was still something real in there. I, I didn't agree with some of the excesses I saw, but I knew there was something, and I just said, I just want the real stuff, get the excesses off, but I just want to see the real stuff. And if it's real, I want it, but I'm not willing to toss it all out just because I found a few aspects being distorted. That would be like this, having people misinterpret scripture every once in a while. Well, therefore, I'm never going to read the Bible again. No, okay, no. The reason you knew they were misrepresenting the Bible is because you were reading it. You need to stay engaged reading the Bible. You don't get rid of the Bible just because a couple people distorted its teachings. In fact, all the more reason to engage the Scripture so that you know when somebody's messing with it. All the more reason, let's stay engaged with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because then when people abuse it, you know. Because you have that relationship with the Holy Spirit. You can go, hey, the Holy Spirit works in my life, and I'm telling you, that's not what it's supposed to look like. Absenting yourself is not a good thing. Especially when God gave us to live by the Spirit. Amen? All right, I know when it's always time to move on, and this is that time, okay? I could stay on that for quite a while. Number three, let's read it out loud. Living a life that's worthy by striving together. He says, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. Now listen, the word striving together is an athletic term. In fact, that word in the Greek is where we get our English word athlete. And it was used generally to refer to, to compete in a contest, especially in a sport such as wrestling. 
So he's saying striving together. So it's, it's, it's almost like a, a wrestling match. However, he uses it in the context of, of, of being, being done with others. So he said, we are together in this wrestling match. It's a tag team. You're in now. You wrestle. Now it's my turn. We're, we're doing this wrestling thing as a team sport. So he's saying this. There is a struggle in our faith. And the struggle tells us sometimes that we're headed the right. Sometimes the struggle can say you're going the wrong way. But sometimes the struggle says, I'm headed the right direction. And then he says this. It's not just struggle. Notice this. As one for the faith of the gospel. It's not just trying to produce unity for the sake of unity. It's this. We have to understand unity comes from a common purpose. Genuine unity must have a purpose. Unity without shared purpose is an exercise in futility. If you can't agree on what the purpose is, you can't get unity. Now, I'm going to go edgy on something here. This is why we're seeing a political breakdown right now. Why? Because they can't even walk into the room and agree on what the purpose of coming into the room is. Everybody's walking into the room representing their political party rather than the nation. And so we have this political divide. There can't, so when I hear that they're going into the room to try to figure something out, I'm just like, unless they come up with what the purpose of even going into the room is, they're going to come out more divided than they went in. If you have one party who's just spending their whole time trying to convince the other party or, or wrangle something, and that's, I mean to say, it greatly concerns me that people are now more loyal to the party than they are to the nation. That, I said I pledge allegiance to the American flag. I did not say I pledge allegiance to the Republican platform or the Democratic platform. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. Parties need to get back to serving the country rather than trying to get the country to serve them. And that's why I said this, this is an impasse. Folks, they can't even agree on how to spend money. I mean, that is the most basic 101 category of any life is, honey, where do you want to go to eat? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's just, it's, just, it's just like basic 101, just spending money. And there's this, it takes forever, this wrangling. It's like, because you guys don't have the same purpose. You have self-serving interests. Oh, God, give us leaders who love people rather than a political party. Did I just say that? <laughs> and then he goes on to say, those who oppose you. Those who oppose you. Now, we're all prepared for people outside of our faith to come after us. But Jesus brings up something in Matthew 7, 15. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are what? ferocious well he didn't say they were wolves he said they're ferocious wow that's pretty descriptive it's one thing to well they're a wolf and it's another thing oh but they're a ferocious they're a ferocious wolf how do you know a wolf is ferocious a ferocious wolf is man a, you can look from a distance you might drive through a park and see a wolf and go oh isn't that wolf just beautiful look how graceful okay now injure yourself and lay in front of the animal and watch it manifest itself. <laughs> and as it growls and its teeth are snarling and the pack comes around you a little bit, suddenly you start to go, hey, you know, this is not so graceful. You know, you know this, this, and why, why did that beautiful animal become so ferocious? Because an opportunity presented itself that it couldn't contain itself. Ferocious wolves are revealed when an opportunity presents itself and they just can't resist they have to go outside the boundaries it's just it's too much for them to stay a person of character and faith they have to go out of character they feel like they have to embellish the situation because 
of what's in, notice it says inwardly there. There's a wild side to them that they've never given control to the Holy Spirit. You go on, and uh, Paul taught the same thing. He's in Ephesus as he was leaving the church. By the way, these are scriptures that make us all uncomfortable. Because we don't like, because, you know, you're like, well, man, do I need to be paranoid? No, you don't need to be paranoid. You just have to understand that sometimes difficult times reveal what's happening inside of a person. Because under calm circumstances, they could control it. But when an opportunity in difficult times presented itself, they couldn't contain themselves. He says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. We don't have any problem there. And then listen, I know that after I leave, savage wolves, notice that savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. So he's saying, be cautious of what comes, but look at this. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. He says they will start playing with this. And we see this in the Christian circle. Suddenly, we got pastors who have been woke. And they're starting to let a lot of things beginning to happen in their congregations, in their services, and you're just going. And they they just basically have said, well, we've been misapplying and misunderstanding Scripture. No, you haven't been misapplying, you haven't been misunderstanding. You just got tired of holding the line, and it's just a lot easier to cave so that you don't have to put up with so much opposition anymore. You're t- you loved it when culture liked you. But now that we find ourselves being marginalized, you're just, you're just tired of having to put up with not being liked. And so you're trying to be this community leader so that people will like you. You've, you've messed with the truth. And now we've got people who are confused about what is Christianity? What does it stand for? And let me just say this, if you're here today, let me just say, the Bible says speak the truth in love. This is not about running people down, this is not about forcing somebody's will on somebody else's will. Let me just tell you today, if you're not a follower of Christ, you absolutely have a right and a choice to make in your own life. No one has the right to remove from you your decision that you feel that you want to make. Even God will honor your choice. But what you have to say is this, you have to be willing to live with the outcome and the consequences of that decision. Not that anybody's going to come after you, but I'm just telling you, God's word tells us the the decisions that bring benefit, and he tells us the decisions that bring conflict and the decisions that bring trouble. And we have a right to say, I don't want to hear that. But then you have to be willing to live with the consequences of those decisions. A man reaps what he sows. So hear me today. That's why why serving Christ is a choice. That's why you can't force a child. You can raise them so they understand. But in the end, even a child has to make the decision on whether they want to serve Jesus or not. It is the human will. And everybody said amen. amen. All right. Last point. Number four, let's read it. Living a life that's worthy by suffering for him, which is Christ. Now, as I wrap this up, look, I, this is probably not the best note to send everybody out on. on a, this is not necessarily a yippy skippy moment. Somebody made fun of me for saying that a few weeks ago. They said, are you from the Midwest? Yes, I am. <laughs> for it has been granted to you. Now, let's stop there. Has been granted is a Greek word, charizo, which is where we get our word grace. So that means to give or grant great, or to give graciously. So, for it has been granted to you. It has been graciously given on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him. So he has graciously given us the ability to have the, the choice to believe in him. How many of you? That's great, all right? But also to suffer for him. Well, that don't sound like grace. When was the last, I mean, think about this. God said, I'm going to be gracious. I'm going to let you make your decision on whether to believe in me. But I'm also going to give you the grace to suffer as I did. Well, I don't see that as grace. I'm like, hey, I, I would rather have the grace that I don't have to suffer that way. But he says, grace 
but also to say, and notice this, Paul says, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I, have, I still have. Paul said, he's giving you the grace to believe, but he's also giving you grace to go through the suffering that Jesus went through, and he's giving you the grace to go through exactly what I'm going through. Wow. Who would have ever called that grace? Think of this. You say, man, living, out, living our faith out in this culture is hard. You know, sometimes you're, we have been so marginalized. Let me put it this way, summarize. We're so marginalized. We're now the jokes on late night TV. You look at any movie that inserts a Christian into the script, we're the joke. We're the ill-informed. We're the, oh, bless their heart. (laughs) They don't know nothing. They mock us. You know, and it's, you're enjoying a good movie, and then all of a sudden, the idiot in the movie is a Christian. And you sit there going, that doesn't represent what I do or who I am and the people that I know. We don't present ourselves like that. What, why does the humor have to be us? I don't, I don't understand. With all the good that we do, all the people we help, all the changed lives that we are involved in doing, and, and just the whole, and we're, we're the funny people. Okay. Jesus had that. He'd go minister to thousands of people, go into another village, and they go, isn't this the son of the carpenter up in Galilee? And they said, can anything good come out of Galilee? Then he'd go to the next time and they next town and they said, crucify him. He, people over here loved him. People here mocked him. And people over there said, kill him. And Jesus said, just thought I'd share a little bit of the glory with you. Welcome to our world. Welcome, welcome that he says that they're still perse- persecuting me and they're still mocking me. God says, I'm giving that to you as grace so that you understand what it was like. That's why, that's why it says in James, consider it pure joy when you go through trials. Wow, okay, why? Because you suffer as Christ did. He says that's grace. Let me tell you, as we wrap this up, Jesus can change your life. Anytime, anytime, anywhere, when you're ready. And everybody said amen. Come on, let's everybody stand and wrap up the service. Come on. Would you just lift your hands this morning before we dismiss? Come on. Praise Him for His grace in your life. Praise Him for the power to live out the gospel in such a conflicted culture, such a conflicted time. Come on, let's praise Him for that. ask that everyone remain standing with their head bowed and before we wrap up the service there might be those who recognize that you need to receive Christ it's not my intent to do this in a way that brings any embarrassment unwanted attention but you would just say man today I want to receive Jesus in just a second I'll say if that's you lift your hand let me just tell you what I'll do when I see your hand I will acknowledge it in a general way I won't call out who you are where you're seated I'll just say enough like, I see your hand, and that means you can take it down. And if anybody has lifted their hand during this period of time, I will lead everybody in a prayer, and that's your chance to accept Christ. And you say, all right, then today's the day I'm going to be accepting Jesus. If that's you, can I see your hand this morning? Anywhere across this place? I don't want to miss anybody. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Anybody else? You say, I'm going to be accepting Christ. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Anybody else? Come on, everybody together, out loud, say this. Dear Jesus, I come to you taking responsibility for my life. And so I confess my sin. I acknowledge my failures. I acknowledge my shortcomings. And I ask for your forgiveness. And I ask that you come into my life and become my Lord and Savior. I receive you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a clap. Come on, thank you for that today. 
Just to let you know, if you accepted Christ, we have a connection group called Alpha, and uh, it's headed up by one of our elders, Scott Primrose, and you can reach him at alpha at bridgeforlife.com. It's done on Zoom. Man, we want to help you get connected and grow in your faith. So, before we dismiss, can we take 60 seconds to pray like we do in the middle of the service? And I want to pray for our nation, that God heal the division, that God heal the hatred, the animosity, and God to not only help our current leaders, whatever leaders are coming in the future, please God, work in all of them, not just some of them. Can I get an amen? Come on, 60 seconds. Everybody lift your voice. Come on, pray for this country. Pray for the leadership. Come on, everybody, lift your voice. Listen, I'm going to say the blessing as I always do, and then afterwards, they will begin to dismiss row by row, beginning in the back. Please stay there in your seat until they get to your row, so that way we don't all congregate in the aisle together. Can I just say something to you? It is really good to see everybody here today. It is really good to see you. Come on, lift your, lift your hands as I say the blessing. I bless you in the name of the Lord. May he bless you in this city and in this county. May the fruit of your womb and the crops of your land, all your livestock be blessed. May he bless the work of your hands at home, at work, at church, in this community. May he bless your coming and your going. May the Lord grant the enemies that are rising up against you be defeated. When they come at you in one direction, let them flee from you in seven directions. May the Lord send a blessing on everything you put your hand to do. May he continue to establish you as his holy people. May all people see you have been called by the name of the Lord. May the Lord grant you prosperity, opening up the heaven, the storehouse of his bounty. May he bless the work of your hands. I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Everybody gave a shout of amen. Come on, let's sing it now as they come and dismiss us. Come on, lift your voice. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you've won. I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence. I am seated in the heavenly place, undefeated, with the one who has conquered it all. When I lift my voice and shout, every 